Hello, everyone. Uh, we're glad to have Peter Salmon with us today. Peter Salmon is an Australian writer living in the UK. He's a regular contributor to The New Humanist and has published in the tablet and also the Prospect magazine. He has written frequently for the Australian TV and radio and also for broadsheets, including The Guardian and the Sydney Review of Books. He has received writer's awards from the Arts Council of England and the Arts Council of Victoria, Australia. Peter is the author of an amazing book, uh, an event, perhaps, a biography of Jacques Derrida, which was published by Versa Publishers in 2020. Peter, we are thrilled to have you with us and thank you for making time for us. Thank you very much. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. Thank you. Uh, let us start with the title of the book. Derrida is a notoriously difficult writer to approach, and you've been brave enough to tackle this task of writing an intellectual biography of Derrida. But what does uh, that title and event perhaps refer to? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, the first thing to say is um, I'm, I'm quite pleased with the title and I, I can boast about it slightly because I don't actually remember when I came up with it, whether I was sort of laying in bed at night or whether I, I had a moment of inspiration somewhere. And, and I'm very, very pleased with the guy who came up with that title. That's very, very good of me. Um, yeah, uh, for, for those who may or may not know sort of a bit of how how Derrida became part of the the, the sort of intellectual firmament. Um, in 1967, he was invited to present a paper at um, the University of Baltimore for a conference they were having about structuralism. Um, at this point, he was a completely unknown philosopher. And in fact, he only got invited because someone else pulled out. And the, the, the seminar was basically trying to introduce structuralism to an American audience. And this was the great sort of vogue philosophy of, of coming out of France at the time. And structuralism essentially says that um, if you want to explain something, you need to look at where it fits into a structure. So if you imagine a grid, basically. Um, so if you want to explain a word, you don't just take it um, by itself. You look at the words around it. You look at how that affects things. Um, the, the one I always think of is God and religion. If you want to explain God, you look at this structure of religion and you look at how things relate to each other, words within religions, religions relating to other religions and so forth. But what Derrida identified is that in order to guarantee a system like that, you need a term that's outside of the system. And the religion God one is a, is a good example where in order to explain religion, the grid of religion, the term God cannot actually fit into the grid. It's not part of religion. It's outside of religion. Now, that term cannot be guaranteed by the logic of the grid. Um, so, you know, God, you can have faith that God exists and you can, of course, build religious thought on it, but you cannot prove it within the grid. Um, in, in the case of philosophy, you have philosophy motoring along to guarantee it. You have truth, which, again, doesn't actually fit into the grid. So he pointed this out, that structuralism was flawed in a very, very basic sense. Um, and that essentially led to the end of structuralism. I mean, it was, it was a classic movie moment where he gets on stage, you know, pulled out of the audience and in 30 minutes decimates the very thing he's supposed to be talking about. Um, so that was, in a sense, an event in the history of philosophy. But Derrida was always very, very suspicious of the word event, um, as other philosophers have been, that somehow that implies a complete break, um, that somehow that implies things were leading up to that complete break. And so he was very suspicious of that idea. He was also very interested in the word perhaps. Um, perhaps seems like a very sort of basic word in our, in our language, but perhaps kind of implies that you're not certain about something. And it's also making a kind of contract with the future, perhaps this will happen. It's opening a way to the future that may not exist. So it's kind of, a, and we'll come back to this, a kind of ghostly word in some senses. So by saying that this was an event, perhaps, I'm kind of referring to both of those things in, in this particular moment in philosophy. Thank you. So basically he was just this unknown teacher who was wanted to talk about structuralism, but he completely dismantled. And there were a lot Absolutely. of famous philosophers such as Roland Barthes at that time in that conference. Yeah, Roland Barthes was there. Jacques Lacan was there and apparently being more or less completely incomprehensible in everything he said. Um, uh, <laughs> yes, some future sort of greats, uh, Paul Man was there, um, who we may come back to a bit later. So yeah, it, it was kind of the, the brightest and best at that stage. Um, Foucault wasn't there, Michel Foucault. Um, every account I read say um, notoriously Foucault wasn't there. I've never quite worked out what he was doing. I've, I've searched and searched, so may, may have been on holiday or something. Um, that was the great and the good, and it, but it was he was a last-minute replacement. And at that point, had only written a few essays, which had been had got a little bit of interest, but nothing else. So it was it was it was a classic movie moment, basically. 
Thank you. Uh, that was a very interesting point you brought up about the idea of perhaps and growth, which we'll come back to later. Uh, I was yes. personally fascinated by all those amazing facts about his life in his childhood, and I could mm. uh, broadly kind of connect the dots and see how they influence mm. his future thinking as a philosopher and also his idea of ideas about identity. Uh, there, there was an interesting quote that you wrote in the book. Uh, because he, I'll just quote from your book. He, he was born at a time when, uh, when uh, France was celebrating its centenary colonization of Algeria. And yes. uh, when it comes to the idea of questions of identity, he's, he says that uh, <clears throat> selfhood, he, de he doesn't use the word identity for some reasons, which mm. would be great if we could talk about. He says that selfhood oh. was thrice dissociated, fractured by three interdicts. So what are those three interdicts? Uh, and, uh, and it would be great if you could tell us a little bit about his background in, in Algeria, because he went through a lot. He was given French uh, citizenship. He was a stripped of citizenship and quotas were introduced. And then yeah. how all these events influenced him uh, and influenced his later thinking in his life. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think there were probably more than three interdicts in the end. I mean, uh, partially it's, he's born in Algeria. So it's the hundredth anniversary of French colonization. Um, and like, and I believe this still happens today, if you're, if you're a part of a French colony in, in any sense, then your education is all French. You are, your language is French. The history you, you learn is French. The geography is French. So basically, he had this entirely French education. Um, he referred to France as the over there that was part of his consciousness. Um, and of course, he's in Algeria. So he's surrounded by an Arab population where he doesn't fit in. Um, so there's a separation there. Um, he pointed out that he was quite dark skinned. So often the French would mistake him for Arab. So it worked both ways. Um, and then on top of that, he was Jewish um, and a very secular Jewish family. But again, even amongst the French then, I mean, this isn't long after the sort of Dreyfus type scandals where that had happened and lots of anti Semitism in France. Um, so he didn't really fit into the Arab population, the French population, or the Jewish population properly um, in, in the terms that they would have wanted. Um, so that was problematic and interesting to start with. Um, he's not obviously the only individual to go through such things. I mean, and I think this is why much of his later writings is about identity and borders and, and so on. Um, but the, the big sort of traumatic event of his life happened at the age of 13. Um, he was a very good student, obviously, very clever, very bright, uh, top of his class. Um, and then in 1943, with the changes in, the, in what was happening in the war, Vichy France started to introduce quotas into um, the schools there, Vichy France being the, the Nazi sympathetic um, government of, of France at that time. And, and Derrida was always keen to point out that it was Vichy France that did this. It wasn't, you know, they were ahead of the Nazis in, in some senses. So the quota system is introduced and gradually Jews are taken out of school and then lose their citizenship. Okay, so they've had citizenship in, in Algeria for many, many years they lose that citizenship, their French citizenship. And for Derrida, this was a hugely traumatic moment um, in the sense that, as I say, he was part of the secular Jewish community. Suddenly he is Jewish. That is his fundamental identity. Now the problem for him isn't of course that he's Jewish. The problem is he has this identity imposed from the outside. He then has to go to a Jewish school. Um, he's taught by other by Jewish teachers who have also been excluded from the education system. So his whole identity is put on this one term. And then after a year, things change in the war and his citizenship is given back. So suddenly he's back at, at, at the same school, albeit being partly turned into an army hospital. So apart from the, the sort of religious implications of this, for him it was a, a huge thing about the arbitrary nature of power, that this government could come in and take citizenship from him when he'd done nothing, would impose an identity on him. And then even the fact that they gave his citizenship back was an arbitrary thing. It was outside of himself. And I do think, and he did say, particularly in his later writings, which were very autobiographical in many ways, he did say that this contested identity um, that he had as an individual, but also being imposed from all sorts of different directions, really affected his thinking. And a lot of his later writings about truth, identity, who we are, and that, that search for the, the, the center of our being was very affected by this. And, you know, I'm, I'm speaking as a white heterosexual male um, in a middle class Anglosphere society. Those are questions that I have to think of intellectually and hopefully do enough 
but I don't have them imposed on me as, as a basic part of my personality. And I know there's lots of people in the world who do have that. And of course, philosophy in the past has always been written by people like me up until fairly recently. And therefore, those questions of identity hadn't really occurred. I'm, I'm talking about Western philosophy, of course, um, hadn't really occurred to Western philosophy. And for Derrida, it was a very, very important thing to, to try and deconstruct those very notions because of, in part, of his background. And, and, and that's why he mentions uh, that he, he felt like he's a child in the margins of Europe. He didn't feel that he really belonged there. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, he, he, he never quite felt at home. And I think the, the sort of Western philosophical voice of authority speaks from a place of home, doesn't it? It speaks from a center place. He never felt he was there. He never felt he was part of the dialogue. He would always say right throughout his life, he was always terrified that, again, the great hand would come down and pluck him away, take him out of wherever he was. He had, I guess we call it imposter syndrome now, um, but he did have that, that idea that out there were powers that could take away what, what he was saying. And when he went to France, again, the first time he went to France, he was uh, 19 years old. Am I right? About That's right, 19 yes. years old. And yep. that I didn't know. I thought he, would, he went there much earlier. And mm. it seems that he was quite disillusioned uh, when he yeah. started studying in France as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'd like to put a grander spin on it than, than the reality, but I think the reality was basically he's away from home for the first time. He throws up on the boat all the way there. Um, he arrives in a Paris which has not recovered from the war basically it's not it's not the beautiful paris that we, we might know, know now it's really a dank horrible place uh he goes into a, a a college we'll call it where um where they had to wear uniforms and there were curfews and 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 also again he didn't quite fit in you know that he's going in with the, the elite of the french um youth um and he's algerian which wasn't unheard of i mean camus did exactly the same journey um but still he's he's, he's put out a, a slight absence um, he flunks his exams. He's, you know, uh, he has a terrible, terrible time for the first couple of years. Um, also, as we as we may discuss, um, there, there was a kind of battle between the Catholics and the Marxists at this college at the time, as there was in France. Um, and you had to choose a side. Um, now he wasn't Catholic, obviously. Um, and in terms of Marxism, um, yes, he was leftward leaning, but uh, perhaps again notoriously, the Marxist Party. Of France had supported um, the French government in its repression of Algeria, so to to join in that battle was not one he was particularly interested in either. Um, also, in, in fundamentally, he had that resistance which many of us have, I'm sure, of joining groups. You know, joining groups, you have to make a series of compromises to do so, and that was not something that ever sat with Derrida for better or worse. So, so he had a, a pretty miserable first few years, to be honest. <laughs> And did he join the French Communist Party after all? No, no, he never, he never did. Uh, um, he obviously flirted with the idea and, and his main kind of mentor, although that's a complicated relationship, was uh, Louis Althusser, who was a Marxist um, and it was in the atmosphere. No, he, he, he really, uh, I always think of that um, Groucho Marx line that I wouldn't want to be part of any club that would have me as a member. Um, I think that, you know, Derrida was a lot like that. Um, one of the, the fundamental things about Derrida's philosophy, for better or worse, is the idea that a decision is an act of violence. That to actually decide to join a group like that is, in a sense, an act of violence against your own intellect. So he didn't join. Um, but, uh, you know, interesting at the moment, he keeps getting accused of cultural Marxism by, by the new the new right, which is um, a very strange situation, but he's been accused of strange things before. So. <laughs> it is. We'll get to that later on. That's a part that I really love to talk about. Uh, sure. Let us talk about his most famous book, Of Grammatology and Deconstruction. Uh, yes. Just for the benefit of the audience, I was wondering, if you, because in the book, you have beautifully, very lucidly have ex explained what this is. So what is deconstruction? Because there's a lot of, there are a lot of misunderstandings about deconstruction. A lot of people think that it's simply breaking down a text, completely yeah. dismantling a text, which is not really that. No, absolutely not. No. Um, well, I'll try and be lucid now. Um, I'm always a bit more lucid on the page. Um, <laughs> um, essentially, deconstruction is what the word says. I mean, Derrida was very um, careful not to use the word destruction um, because that is taking something apart and leaving it broken and, and ruined and finished. Um, so deconstruction is to take something which has been constructed 
and to look at how it's being constructed and to look at what is going on in that. So to an extent, it's taking a part of text. Um, but the, the example I, t I often use to, to simplify things is, is imagining a chair. You know, a chair you can just sit on, you, you know, you don't have to comment on it, you can just look at it, sit on it, do, do whatever, you don't have to think about it at any stage. But if you want to, you can look at what that chair means. You know, if you see a chair in someone's house, um, how it's constructed, the design, the ergonomics, what that chair might say about the person who you're, whose house it's in, you know, their, their interest in fashion, their lack of interest in fashion, their income, all of those things. So you take all of those aspects to it and you then look at what that chair means in that sense. So that's a part of deconstruction. So the chair remains there and you can still sit on it and other people can sit on it without going through deconstruction. Um, but that's one element of it. The second thing is what we touched on a bit earlier, where we said that if you have a system, the thing that guarantees that system is outside of that system. So again, we'd look at religion and God or philosophy and truth. Um, so what David has said is if you can't guarantee the thing that holds everything together, you know, that's a constructed thing as well. Okay. So, so when you're deconstructing a text, for instance, Derrida noticed something he called metaphysics of presence, which is exactly this. There remains this kind of confidence that if you have a, a and let's go with a book, that that is whole and complete and total somehow. And that, you know, in, in a sense, we, we almost carry the myth that the author sat down, started on page one, got to the end, and that was it. That the author wasn't affected by changes, um, that the book wasn't affected by changes, that it wasn't edited in a way, and that it's, it's whole and complete in itself. Again, Derrida says there's nothing that guarantees that. In fact, you know, a, a text is, is just a part of what's going on here. And so deconstruction is also looking at how things are made within that text. Um, if, if a word, if we're looking at a text of philosophy, if a word like justice is used um, on page three, and then on page 18, it's used again, he's looking for any subtle differences in the way it's used that the author hasn't noticed. You know, texts generate their own meanings. So he's looking for little things like that. You know, if you're looking at a novel, um, you might enjoy the novel, it's absolutely fantastic. And then you notice that there's no black people in the novel, and yet it's written in a time when there were. So what, what does that mean about what's going on here? What are the politics and so forth? So he's constantly taking these, these texts apart. He said he only deconstructed texts that he loved. So he wasn't trying to destroy them, but he was merely saying that there is an instability in all of these texts. And it's very interesting and often quite revealing to look at what is unstable about these texts that can reveal more than the author knows or is letting on. Thank you. That was an excellent explanation. And... Uh... In that explanation, what is clear is that deconstruction is not actually a method that you bring into a text. It's already happening in the text, right. which, which you've also mentioned in the book. Because a yeah, lot of people have this yes. idea that it's a set of uh, ideas or principles that you can apply to a text, especially mm -hmm. in the English departments where I study. But yes. that's not the case. It's simply looking at how the looking for those moments of instability inside the text and see how it's breaking the, that logic of presence or metaphysics of yeah. presence that is. This That's right. And, and I mean, I think Derrida sort of saw the way that texts are deconstructing themselves as actually part of the motor of literature, of literature, you know, that, you know, as soon as I write a paragraph, there's going to be contradictions, there's going to be exclusions, there's going to be all this sort of stuff. And in a sense, that's what gives them life, you know, that, 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 you know, if it, a completely stable text would basically be the word of God, you know, just saying one word, and that's your stable text. Anything over and above that, is something that's, that's deconstructing itself. And so Derrida is just noticing that about it. Um, so yeah, as you say, it's within the text rather than imposed from outside the text. Thank you. Uh, let us talk about his second most important book or some or a book that a lot of people think is his second most important book, which is uh, Spectre of Mar uh, sorry, uh, Spectre of Marx. And yes. in the book, you provide this excellent background, well, it's a context to the uh, around the time when the, when 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 um, Derrida wrote the book, it was the fall of Berlin Wall. It was the collapse of mm -hmm. communist, uh, kind of communist Eastern Bloc in Europe, and then Fukuyama's mm -hmm. idea of the end of history. So it seems that there was this uh, celebratory moment in the history of Europe, and then mm -hmm. uh, Derrida comes and writes this book, Spectre of Marx. So I guess that's where he he's more. He's more comfortable talking about Marxism or maybe being more explicitly aligned with Marxism. Yeah, I mean, one of the important things about Spectres of Marx is it's not a book about Marx and it's not even a book about Marxism, really. Um, you know, there is this triumphal moment um, when the Berlin Wall 
fell. The, obviously, Western liberalism had triumphed, and it triumphed because it was good, because it was better. Um, and Derrida, at this point, having not talked about Marx all these years, you know, being one of the few French intellectuals who hadn't, chooses this moment to actually start to talk about Marx. Um, and what he was basically saying is that, okay, let's imagine for a moment Marxism is dead. I mean, he didn't agree with that, but let's imagine that for a moment. That, as the title is, this spectre of Marxism will continue to haunt Western consciousness. That this will still be kind of the, the idea that's underneath everything, that the ghost of Marx will, will wander about amongst us. Um, part of this is, is one thing that Derrida was very, very good at, which was taking a particular thinker and reading against the grain, to use a, 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 a Barthes term. So Marx, the great materialist, you know, everything's material, there's no spirit, there's no da da da. Um, they always said, well, okay, I'm going to look for traces of spirits, spectres, ghosts, and so forth in the work of Marx. Um, he did a similar thing with Hegel, Hegel being the great sort of family man, as it were. He, he looks for instabilities about the you know, spirit and, and so forth in there. Um, so with Marx, he says, okay, well, I'm going to look for I'm going to look for traces of ghosts. And there in you know the communist manifesto, the first sense is a spectre is haunting Europe, the spectre of communism. Um, so he sees that immediately. And what I think has been interesting about a lot of the recent stuff about Derrida, where people are saying that he's just terrible cultural Marxist, and 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 we look at CRT and and all of that stuff that's happening in America, which I'm sure we'll come to. Um, the people who are who are screaming and stamping their feet about all of this are doing exactly what Derrida said would happen in the book, that you know Marxism isn't going to die. Here we are, what you know, uh, thirty odd years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, and still there's this obsession with this terrible Marxist thing that, that could be happening. The ghost is still going on, and um, and that is exactly what Derrida said in the book that they're he's sort of uh, you know getting angry about. Um, the other thing it introduces, and I, I'm sure we'll, we'll cover this in, in some detail, is the idea of hauntology, which is um, comes out of this book. Now, hauntology is um, a homonym with ontology, particularly in, if you say it with a French accent, ontology being what there is in philosophy, O-N-T-O-L-G-Y, then hauntology for Derrida was what there isn't. So he thought there was a problem in philosophy, um, which relates to all these other things he's talked about where it's just, in a sense, an accounting for what's, what there is. If you, if you look at a particular area in order to sort of talk about it philosophically, you look at the stuff that's around. Derrida thought there was more going on. Um, he thought there were ghosts, as it were, within the machine. Well, well not within the machine, within, within the world. You know, people who have died, um, our sense of mourning about people who have died. Um, there's one example he gives where, you know, everything that we use has probably been made by someone who's dead. So there's that sense of it. Um, also, the gaps between words, the things unsaid, all of these these kind of things that haunt our consciousness in the same way that Marx haunts the consciousness of Western liberalism. And he was very interested in looking at these things and, and how they affect our discourse. Um, anytime I choose a word, every sentence I'm saying here, I could say a completely different set and give a completely different meaning. Those, those, those lost things. He was also very interested in this idea of lost futures that you know, um, he, he saw that, to take 50s Britain as an example, which he gets close to using, which is kind of in the, in the firmament of where I am. You know, there was a, there was a great move towards you know, socialism of, of services. It was the birth of the NHS. It was the, you know, various kind of services came in, public broadcasting and so forth, where it was felt that everyone was a participant. And that was seen as a great future thing that was going to happen. That's reversed almost completely now. But for many, that future still exists in some sense, and that future is still yearned for, and that future still informs discourse in ways that are interesting. Thank you. And, and Derrida also uses the idea of ghosts when he talks about cinema or photography, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. It's this absolutely. idea of being there, but at the same time, not being there features a lot in his works. Exactly. You know, just, I mean, the basic banal fact of, you know, a lot of films that we watch, most of the people in it, have died you know, that's part of it um and the world that they inhabited has died but he also um he was in a, a very strange film uh ghost dance which some people love i think it's just nonsense um <laughs> it's, it's it's a bit mad these, these two women are trying to find derrida around london and he acts as himself really badly um but there's one scene which has kind of become a little bit key in his in his oeuvre um, where he talks, he has someone ask him if he believes in ghosts. 
And the character who asked him um, is a young actress who died um, pretty much before the film came out, uh, but was certainly dead when Derrida watched the film. And he recounts this occasion of her having to ask him 20, 30 times till they got the right take um, about ghosts. You know, do you believe in ghosts? Do you believe in ghosts? And he talked about the first time he watched it and just got the, you know, a chill because here was a person who was dead asking him if he believed in ghosts. And he thought this was kind of how cinema and photography works, that we have these incredible presences um, come to us and, and we see them and we forget that they're, they're ghostly presences. They're not in the room, even if the person is in fact alive, they're, they're not in the room with us, but they affect us in, in, in many, many ways. Um, so, yeah, so that's an interesting use that he made of, of that. Thank you. Um, let's talk about uh, today's reception or understanding of Derrida, Foucault, or uh, or postmodernism or French theory in general. So uh, yeah. it seems that like, just like uh, you said, like a specter is haunting Europe. I guess the specter of Derrida is also haunting a lot of people these days. <laughs> really? Uh, yes. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. French theory. I don't know what is it about French theory that freaks a lot of people out, especially conservatives, right wingers. And mm. uh, there are a lot. There is a lot of mis and, and I guess Derrida himself or Foucault were not comfortable with being called postmodernists. Mm. So no. And yes. uh, they have been usually called the progenitor of, let's say, wokeism, or people who are against truth, or people who are trying to dismantle or completely destroy the whole foundation of Western mm. civilization, which are all mm. wrong accusations. But what is it about French theory that scares a lot of conservatives? And especially yeah. Derrida, because he has been called here by, by lots of people like Jordan Peterson, Daniel Dennett, they've been called, he's been called an evil or people who mm. are just peddling intellectual fads. And in your book, you write and mention people who have even gone uh, far enough to attribute the rise of political demagogues such as Donald Trump to, mm. to French theory or Derrida. Mm, what absolutely. is it about Derrida that is haunting all these people? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's very strange I, I, because I obviously because the book came out, I often sort of look Derrida up in various forums and on Twitter and so forth. And um, some of the stuff that's said about him is is completely, you know, wacko sort of stuff. Um, so, but let's disregard that and let's look at the kind of mainstreaming of, of the opposition to him. I mean, it's it happened throughout his life too. I mean, he was always a very controversial figure. Um, all, all, you know, it's it's. I think there was a little bit of the fact that he was, you know, this good-looking, charismatic Frenchman, you know, with a pipe who, you know, would, would get on major television shows. Um, you know, I, I there was a, an incident where he was asked about whether he watched Seinfeld, the American comedy, because they said, you know, this is obviously deconstructing the, the sitcom. Do you watch it? And he said, no, I, I, I don't watch it. Um, but I was, um, I was in Australia um, when that happened because it's an Australian interview. And it's basically a, a sort of a magazine style program where you would talk about, you know, the latest cookware and then, you know, what's happening with the royal family and then an interview with Jacques Derrida and then new security systems. So it was, it was very much in the popular culture. And so if you're a tenured professor working somewhere and not getting on television, then, you know, that's going to make you a little bit cross. Um, also, the obscurity of his style. I mean, I think a lot of philosophy, and we'll get on to the politics in a moment, a lot of philosophers... Um, clarity is the main thing that they 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 want, okay? Um, and that is a method. I mean, Derrida points out that clarity is a type of method. You know, it's not a true method. It's got its advantages and disadvantages. But for those for whom clarity is philosophy, um, Derrida was very, very challenging. Um, so there's all those things. But it kind of, a lot of this comes back to what we were talking about right at the start about identity. You know, Derrida did question identity in ways that Western philosophy hadn't done as much of, and certainly not you know, as, as fully as he did it. And I think a lot of the backlash at the moment, I, I don't think it's wrong to say, comes from very right wing, very white, uh, very conservative forces. So Derrida is seen as this figure who disrupts all of that. And you know, I, I tend to think of it almost in scientific terms. You know, when, when Kant wrote about what it is to be a human, his sample set, was white males basically? Um, that's you know that's who he was looking at. Now the sample set has grown since then to include a lot more you know voices speaking back. Um, you know at the time Kant was writing, people who you know, weren't white males in Europe didn't have a voice. Now they do. So therefore, philosophy has to change to incorporate that. Um, however, these sort of political forces obviously don't want a bar of that because that threatens their position. In terms of the whole sort of fake news truth thing. You know, the accusation is that Derrida was anti-truth. Um, now, 
He's not. You know, he pointed out a very specific thing about philosophy, that the big T truth that philosophy is aiming for was a faith rather than something that could be proved in exactly the same way that God is a faith. You know, you can have that faith, or you can have a faith that God does not exist. Both are, you know, positions you can have, but they can't actually on earth be proved. After death, we'll find out. Um, he was the same with, you know, philosophy and truth, you know, that truth can't be proved. So big T truth, yes, under question. However, in our normal life, and I do think Derrida was trying to get at what our normal life is like in the way that philosophers should, we have lots of different definitions of truth. You know, we have the truth of quadratic equations. If you, if I do two plus two equals four, you'll say that's true. You may also read a poem and say that's true. You may talk to a friend and they, you know, they tell you about something that's happening in their life and you say that's true. I say it's, it's raining outside, you go out, get wet, that's true. There's all these very different registers of truth that we use and we never notice that we're moving between them. You know, that is how we are in, in normal life. Um, so to say that there is no big T truth is in a sense uncontroversial about the way we live our lives. You know, we live our lives moving between these registers of truth constantly. But what has happened, and it is sloganeering and it is propaganda, I believe, is that people who want to denigrate the identity politics of Derrida, who want to look at that, have just taken he doesn't believe in truth and hammer him with it. Um, same, same with Foucault. Um, they, they also seem to say that he's evil or unethical and so forth. If you read any of the French philosophers, they are obsessed with ethics, you know, in a way that, in fact, analytic philosophers aren't. Analytic philosophers want to, you know, get rid of all ethical considerations when they're, when they're looking at a problem. You know, um, whereas the, right from his first writings and Foucault's first writings and Barthes and so forth, they're always obsessed by ethics with trying to work out how to live. Um, so, so again, that accusation doesn't hold water. Um, and the final one of these is, is the CRT, critical race theory. Um, now, as, as you, your, your listeners, your readers and students may be aware, you know, critical race theory just says that racism isn't individual. It can be, but it's not totally, but it exists within institutions. You know, institutions, by mistake sometimes or unconsciously or sometimes consciously, exclude particular people from, from what they do. Now, that's fairly uncontroversial, or it's always been a fairly uncontroversial position, or at least in the last 40 or 50 years. Um, the people who are arguing against CRT, saying it shouldn't be taught in schools, even though it's not, um, are, are basically just using it as a blunt instrument for their racism, I think. I don't think there's anything more sophisticated than that. Um, if you, if as sometimes I do, you comment on anyone who's saying they're against CRT and saying, what do you mean, what's about it, they, they tend to go silent. They don't actually have a sophisticated argument against it. You know, I think some of the identity stuff, yes, there's sophisticated arguments on both sides. With that sort of stuff and cultural Marxism, there is no thing. They have just chosen a word to peddle their racism, is my, my feeling. Yeah, interesting. Just yesterday, I saw a video. It was, I guess, in Virginia. There was this reporter asked this white, uh, I guess, senior citizen in the States, uh, what, is, uh, what is the most important issue in this election? It said CRT. And then he asked him, what is critical race theory? So I don't know the details, but that's something that I, that's not something that I would care for. He couldn't define yeah. it. He didn't even know what it was. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, it's, it's just very, very handy. I mean, it's what propaganda has always done, hasn't it? You give a label, you empty it all meaning, and then you just use it again and again and again. And this is, this is what's going on. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think Derrida has been kind of, again, held up as a poster boy, which I sometimes think would surprise him because it's so against what he wrote. Um, but sometimes I think it wouldn't surprise him because the number of times he's been taken up, you know, in this position and, and used to sort of flog a position uh, against him is 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 a lot. Um, I mean, I think the, the the interesting thing where it is about Derrida rather than just being, you know, anything else, is Derrida because of the stuff we were talking about before is very interested in identity. And he's also very interested in singularity. Um, he's very interested in the fact that each single individual is different. Um, and he, he he wrote a lot about 9-11 and that, you know, whenever you kind of totalise that event about politics and so forth, you can forget the individuals who were involved and the individuals are important and different and so forth. And, you know, but, um, and he sort of transposes that to all situations that, you know, all voices can and should be heard. Now, obviously, practically, there are times when you have to bring things together as a group, but you should never mistake bringing things together together as a group for the truth of all those people. And again, it's a bit like when we were saying he can't join a club because he doesn't want to sort of contradict himself. 
you, you, you have to kind of acknowledge that individuality. And certainly within the university system um, at the moment, there is, a, there is a reckoning happening where voices that have been excluded are now being included. And that's complicated. And of course it's complicated. And there will be people who push back against it. There are people who are threatened by it and some of them for valid reasons, you know, they, they find that threatening. But it's a whole system of incorporation happening at the, top, at the moment. And Derrida is part of that, that system. Um, and, you know, it, it, for, for me, it's a very interesting thing to see where we end up with this, you know, where, where people like me, again, white, heterosexual, middle-class males are being challenged on our privileges and what our unconscious biases and so forth. You know, that's a fascinating thing. But if you are dead against it, then you, you, you fight back with all you've got. And another thing about uh, Derrida's difficult style, which has been, I guess, uh, uh, one of the reasons that he has a lot of enemies, let's say, is that he that that those uh, accusations of being obscure. Uh, but I guess part of what he was doing in his writing was to perform his philosophy. Absolutely. In, in his yeah. writing, he's performing that idea of deconstruction. I guess Pierre, a lot of French uh, philosophers have done that. I guess Pierre Bourdieu's writing is mm. also difficult. He writes a sentence, and then another sentence is an explanation of the previous sentence. Then he writes yes. the third sentence explaining the second one. Then he writes a whole book about that. And, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, for, for me, that is, one of the things I wanted to do with Derrida was fit him back into sort of the philosophy mainstream, as it were, because I think on both sides, both his opponents and the people who like him have tended to say he's this unique thing happening and, you know, down he comes and either destroys things or changes things. Or whatever. I wanted to fit him into the, the history of philosophy. Um, and... A lot of philosophers have actually sort of noticed the, the sort of deconstructive problem. You know, I, I was reading Plato Timaeus recently, and he says, you know, whenever you whenever you look at a whole system, there's always a little bit of stuff left over. And he just says it in one sentence and then goes back to what he was talking about. And throughout the history of philosophy, a lot of people have noticed this kind of instability of language, you know, the, the difficulty of getting to truth. But what they've tended to do is, is write normally, point that out, and then just continue writing as though they hadn't said it. Um, and I think one of the, uh, well, I think his ma Derrida's major achievement in some senses is the fact that having noticed that, he then realised he couldn't continue to write in the same way. He, he, he's, it, once you've said that words aren't stable, that their meaning isn't stable, your writing, in Derrida's case, has to reflect that. Um, and it also then opens up stuff like um, religious writing and literature and so forth. Derrida is saying that these types of writing have truth as well, you know, that types of truth as well you know philosophy doesn't isn't the only thing that can do that and therefore when Derrida was writing if writing in a religious sort of style um uh, incantationary style um got his point across or poetry or whatever he was quite happy to do that um and he didn't see that as going against his method it, that was part of his method um now it has for traditional philosophers made things more difficult because that's a very different way of doing things and for the general reader it makes things more difficult of course um because some of these texts are very difficult um we we sort of briefly touched on of grammatology before and of grammatology is really hard to read and i pretended i'd read it for many many years um you know and it was one of the kind of thrills of writing the book was i actually had to try and read it and understand it but i do say in my biography it's a bonkers book you know it's just it's it's basically everything Derrida knows at that point just thrown down on the page. Um, but I think the way to read it is not to sweat as I did and most people do over uh, each paragraph. What does this mean? What does this mean? It's almost to read it like a novel. It is to, to sort of get into it and enjoy the sound of it and enjoy all these things. And gradually, I think meaning starts to emerge by doing that in the same way that it does in a novel. And it can be very easy to be intimidated by Derrida's writing. Um, but if you do sort of enjoy the reading of it, um, it the, the, the stuff does come through eventually. <laughs> yeah, I guess, and that's the case with a lot of uh, difficult philosophers as well, or writers, novelists, such as James Joyce. Right? Absolutely. Ulysses, yep. yeah. Yep. So uh, don't, read, don't read it to try to understand it. The first time at this, just read it. And enjoy yeah, the absolutely. music of the words, right? Because that was part of the reason they were writing that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, and Derrida loved philosophy and loved language and loved literature, you know, and loved Joyce, in fact. Um, and so this is this is kind of one of the, the pleasures. And I mean, it it is one of the things that makes me a bit cross when people sort of say that he's trying to destroy philosophy or whatever. He loved it, he adored it, but he adored reading really, really closely to it and you know, seeing what what was being said. Um, and the, the pleasures of language, which I know is a Bart's phrase, but, you know, 
certainly for Derrida it applied, sort of getting in there and having this stuff happen and, and seeing what it means. And because of that start of writing where generally his philosophy has been wrongly called a uh, charlatan or a relativist, and more recently, mm. uh, very famous, let's say, public intellectuals, if that's the right term for these people, or uh, mm. celebrities, I tend to use these terms, so public celebrities yes, such as, better. yeah, much better, <laughs> Jordan Peterson <laughs> have, uh, have talked about uh, Derrida or, or Helen Pluckrose and... Uh, yeah. I don't remember the name of the James other guy. Lindsay. Yeah, James, James Lindsay. Lindsay. And I, I always love to read a critique of some people that I love, but I've tried to mm. listen to Jordan Peterson talk about him, but he never talks about Derrida himself. So you've yeah. read Derrida, you've written about Derrida. So when it comes to these people, mm. uh, what is it that ticks you off most? So do you find any, <laughs> let's say, Where's do you that? find any legitimate criticism or engagement, critical engagement with Derrida's works in their speech they don't write about these they just it, they just talk it's mm, they, yeah well, Peterson well, hasn't written about Derrida he talks about Derrida so have you yeah. come across yeah. any critical well, engagement with these works yeah well Helen Pluckrose and James Lindsay wrote a book um which disappointed me because I thought because it, it has all the marks for scholarly text um yeah, and cynical 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 theorists yeah theorists, and yeah, yeah they which basically seem to be saying that, you know, all the people of the left or of continental philosophy or whatever, however you want to term it, were cynics in some way and they were just in it for the money, which, um, I mean, you know, if anyone's, you know, been in academia, you're not doing it for the money. Um, and also it, it assumes that somehow they're dominant in, in academia, which which they're not. Um, it's really, it's not a well-written book. And I was disappointed in that. Um, you know, James Lindsay since then has gone a bit nuts on Twitter, you know, um, like, kind of getting all, all righty um helen pluckrose hasn't but you know i just it, it's kind of thumbnail caricatures of all of these things which are then taken apart seen as a great threat so it's just you know badly written book badly edited you know has stuff like you know on page three german philosopher frederick nietzsche and then on page seven german philosopher frederick nietzsche it's just like get an editor or something so anyway that stuff um peterson frustrates the hell out of me because i mean he's obviously intelligent I think his agenda is not very good. I think he's doing it for the wrong reasons. Maybe I think he's the cynic. Um, I guess we always accuse our opponents of being the cynics, don't we? Um, uh, but he's got his particular barrier to push. But every time he mentions Derrida, it just is so evident he hasn't read him. And, you know, I, I, I am going to boast for one moment now. There was a dialogue between Stephen Fry, the English intellectual comedian, and Jordan Peterson, where Stephen Fry says, well, you should read Peter Salmon's book. It'll change your mind about Derrida. At which point I hope that Peterson is say, oh, I will, or, you know, yes, indeed, or no, I'm never going to read it or whatever. But like in every sort of encounter with the word Derrida, Peterson just then went on to a different thing. And I, I, I desperately want him to read some Derrida to sort of see what he actually reckons. Because um, he obviously hasn't. He's obviously not going to. He's obviously resistant in some very basic sense to it. Um, is there part of him that thinks it might be true? Is there not? Or, or what's going on there? Because I think actually a lot of Derrida's stuff wouldn't be challenging to Edison. There are there are parts of Derrida about individual choice and so forth, which I think could be incorporated into Peterson's, I mean, reluctantly in, on Derrida's part, but, but it could be. I mean, it's not all anti-Jordan Peterson. Um, but um, he, he doesn't seem inclined to read those things. Um, he's very much, I guess he knows his audience, and I guess you know, Derrida is as a sort of, you know, a, a, a scarecrow who you can set up to knock down works for that. Um, but it's incredibly frustrating. Um, and I try not, I mean, it, it allies to me with these people who, you know, make accusations about Derrida that, again, they obviously haven't read him. Um, you just think that part of being a philosopher is to read and critique your opponents um, or the people you don't agree with. Um, to disagree with them, to continue to disagree with them and to disagree with them more, in a more sophisticated way. Um, but not just to say they're bad. Um, and, you know, let's let's even imagine for a moment that the effects of Derrida have been bad, which obviously I don't believe and I think that's completely wrong. Um, that still says nothing necessarily about you know, Derrida's position. So go back and read the text. You know, there's, there are some short texts. You know, if he doesn't have time, just go back and read something short. Um, but, yeah, so I, I find his position, A, dangerous, um, but that's all, all his other stuff, but B, it just it baffles me that he won't, that he's building such a career on particular antagonisms, but doesn't seem to want to read the people he's antagonizing about. 
Yeah, thank you. And I guess part of it is also this, especially with uh, Helen Pluckrose, I tend to think that it's more like a marketing ploy because look, if you're in academia, you know, uh, because Helen Pluckrose introduces himself as somebody who has been banished from academia. But the thing mm. is that uh, you can't get into academia easier. There are people who do a PhD, who do a postdoc, they still can't get into academia. Yeah. It's, it's a very tough market, so, and, and Helen uh, Helen Pluckrose has a master's degree. So, mm. we, like I said, even with a PhD, you can't easily get into academia. And part yeah. of it is, I guess, it's a kind of a marketing ploy. It's the same thing that Alan Sokol did. With Ad, but Alan Sokol did try to engage with those ideas. Yeah, he read some of those yeah. philosophers. He quoted them. Time, mm. I guess, at times he misquoted Deleuze, but mm. but that's a difference. And and um, Alan Sokol says that he has nothing against postmodernism. It's only Postmodern postmodernist use of scientific or mathematical terms without out of the context or without explaining those terms in depth. So I mean, he yep. clearly says that I'm not refuting postmodernism. So I guess yeah, that's kind of become a uh, like I said a, because you know if you can create a sensation in the media, mm. you're there. You yep. become famous. Yeah. So yeah, they, they they they've read these texts. Helen Pluckers mm. and I mean the trio. I don't remember all their names. And they created yeah. that kind of uh, that that hoax, um, yeah. uh, which is not defensible, of course. I mean, the, the editors mm. should have been more careful. But again, I re I re they I read in an article that said that they had even quoted um, Hitler. Mm. So I tried to find that article, but what they had quoted from Hitler was actually it was a page from Hitler's book. But all those problematic terms were taken out. So the terms they used was mm. explain, describe, all the terms that everybody uses in their speech. So that's yeah. not really quoting from Hitler. So I think yeah, it's kind of a marketing ploy to get to know to get a platform, and they yeah. did successfully. They have a lot of followers on, on yes. Twitter or YouTube. They wrote books. They get invited, mm -hmm. but they don't really engage with those things. Because Roger Scruton, I I love his ideas about arts. I don't like mm -hmm. his idea. I don't agree with his ideas about critical. Because I guess again, he 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 kind of uh, he wrote that book, Fire um, Fools, Frauds, and Firebrands, and anybody yeah. he doesn't like is in that book. Michelle yeah, Fikou, absolutely. Derrida, Edward Said. Um, yeah. He quotes from them again, but he quotes from them selectively. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, this is, I, I, th I think you're absolutely right. Um, you know, and I, I mean, again, with, with reading the screws on, I, I don't think he read them at all, or, or certainly not closely. Um, I had forgotten when you were just talking there in, in the Pluck, Rose and Lindsay book, the only time they actually mentioned Derrida, um, they sort of they, they vaguely mentioned deconstruction and stuff like that, but it's kind of um, a whistle-stop tour. But the one sentence they say is something like, um, Derrida is notorious for their often mistranslated, um, they do the French and then um, there is nothing outside the text. So the example there is, is the mistranslation. You know, that's, that's kind of, you know, <laughs> the, the actual translation is closer to is there is no outside text. Um, but they say he's often mistranslated or well, he's sentenced to it. And then you use the mistranslation, you just go, did you just Wikipedia that? I mean, did, <laughs> that's, 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 it really feels, it feels a bit like, you know, when I think it actually came out of my book at the end, what I said right at the start that Foucault was notoriously absent from the thing. That's from Wikipedia because I don't know where he was. So I've just cut and pasted in, in, into the original manuscript. So they've obviously done that. This is the mistranslated phrase and stuck it in. It's like, well, did you do any exploring of that? You, you, you yeah, I was going to say idiots. Idiots. <laughs> uh, just well, was was there the relativist as he's usually accused of being? Absolutely not. No, I mean this is he said again and again and again and again. I'm not a relativist, and this is exactly what I was saying before about truth. You know that he, but merely saying that there is no absolute truth does not mean that there is no there are no truths. You know, truth is, and let's go back to the deconstructing the chair. You know, truth is a word that is used in many different ways in many different contexts. Um, there's a great thing Wittgenstein says at one point where he says, if you want to know um, the meaning of the word God, look at how it's used. And in a sense, that's what Derrida is doing. If you want to know the meaning of truth, look at how it's used. You know, sometimes it's used for political purposes. Sometimes it's used for mathematical purposes. Sometimes it's used for literary purposes. Um, sometimes I will do it in order to cover up a lie. There's all of these things, but that's not relativism. Um, that is merely exploring those ideas and taking them apart and not saying, you know, totalitarian sense there is one truth there's one absolute truth that we all have to follow 
And I also love to talk about his close friend, uh, Darius' close friend, Paul Deman, because uh, <laughs> right, yes, uh, yeah. So I'll let you because there was this interesting episode in his life that you've written in yeah. your book as well. Absolutely. Well, I I think there was a um a turn in well, Derrida himself said, and others have said that there was a turn in Derrida's work towards ethical thinking. Um, and I use my kind of biographer's prerogative to to find a personal reason for that. Um. Paul de Man was a really interesting character, and we're going to use the word notorious again. Um, de Man was a very brilliant Derridian. He was a literary scholar at the Yale School, Yale University, uh, the Yale School of, 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 of Literary Studies. Um, he took what Derrida was doing and was, I think, particularly brilliant at close reading literary texts, uh, Shelley and, and, and so on, uh, looking at rhetoric. Um, and was a very close friend of Derrida's. It was there right from the start. He was actually at the Baltimore conference as an audience member. Um, they spoke to each other you know, very often, um, bounced ideas off each other. So the man dies, Derrida gives his eulogy in the 80s, late 80s, 90s. Um, and then it emerges that Paul de Man worked for a Nazi newspaper during the Second World War. Now, of course, that might be, you know, there, but for the grace of God go I, you know, who knows what individual choices any one of us would have made at that particular time. Um, but it then turns out he was basically sacked from the Nazi newspaper for fraud and lying and so forth. So, you know, getting sacked from a Nazi newspaper is quite difficult to do, I'm sure. Um, he then, um, he sets up shell companies to do publishing and gets grants and buggers off without paying the money. He's a bigamist. He moves to America, marries a wife, even though he's got another wife. Um, he makes up a whole load of qualifications in order to get into Harvard. Um, just you know, completely lies about them, and with the chaos of war, gets away with it. Ends up in this incredibly senior position, and you know he's basically a sociopath. Um, none of which is reflected in his writings, although people scour his writings now for, for clues, as it were. So, so Derrida's best mate is a sociopathic liar who was a Nazi, um, and this is not great. Um, the this all comes out, of course, um, after the death of of, of Paul de Man. Derrida then writes what I think is his worst paper, and it's almost inexcusable. And I think it was him doing what he could do for a mate. Um, he writes a paper where he sort of basically says, what was it like to live with this lie for 30 years? You know, isn't that fascinating? It is fascinating. And in a couple of hundred years time, I think people should write papers about what it was like to live with this lie for all this time. But in a couple of hundred years time, and not as a best friend shortly afterwards. And Derrida was rightly torn to shreds with this, you know, that this was excusing the behaviour, that this wasn't the main point, you know, um, you're Jewish, why would you be def in any way defending someone who was, you know, who'd done all of these things? And I do think that Derrida was really bruised by it. I think, you know, he'd, he'd had some controversies about his use of Heidegger's philosophy when you know, some of the Nazi stuff about Heidegger was coming out. And also it very much played into this idea that deconstruction was somehow these crazy people who were destroying everything. And, you know, it, it made sense that someone like Paul Demand, you know, here, here's, here's a philosophy where we're saying that it's questioning truth. And one of its main proponents was a serial liar. So it all, all kind of fitted together. Um, so Derrida then went back to, he always claimed he was always writing about ethics. Um, and in, in a sense he was, but he went back to looking at ethics and law and justice um, and did things like, you know, again, to go back to our, our old sort of metaphor, as it were, you know, justice sits outside of law and that law is this grid um, which is generated by justice. Justice can never be reached in the same way that truth and God can never be reached. Um, so, so he was very interested in, in law and has had quite a lot of influence in legal philosophy and in sort of legal studies. Um, so that was a really major thing for him, I think, that he was, he was left very much exposed by this. He did, I think, and I think he thought the wrong thing um, and therefore had to had to sort of restake the claims for deconstruction being a method that was still looking for truth, but that yes, it didn't think it would ever find it. Thank you. And uh, as a last question, uh, we're living in difficult times, turmoil, there's turmoil all over the world, climate change, capitalism. How do you think, uh, Derrida is relevant in today's day and age? Well, I think he's relevant in exactly what we're talking about, being able to deconstruct these narratives that are coming out. I mean, we do live in a time where there's endless chatter, isn't there? It's just constant. Um, but 
part of the sort of mainlining of that is you do have these, I think, totalitarian voices trying to tell us that there is a particular type of truth. I mean, the sort of the, the kind of bullhorn politics that we had out of America recently, um, that we've had, we've got out of Brazil at the moment. Um, it's happening a bit in the UK. Um, I think it's happening a bit in Australia as well. Various places in the world where this one source of, sort of truth is being sort of yelled at us, basically. And for Derrida, again, you always have to look at why that's being said. Who, who who's signing the checks, as it were? You know, you have to take apart those those statements. Um, in terms of the you know environment, again, we have we we have multinationals trying to hide what is glaringly obvious to everyone, and, and you know is, is gradually becoming so glaringly obvious that even politicians can't can't battle against it. But again, those kind of those little micro negotiations that are happening without looking at the big picture are, are again being informed by ideology in, in many, many ways. But I think also that the, the fundamental thing he's doing, as we talked about before, is trying to give voice to a lot of people who have been marginalized, who have been outside of the mainstream. And that by giving those people voices, um, you do try and find some consensuses, consensi, that are not this kind of from the dominant powers as they've been. And I, I have faith in, in humanity, and, and I think Derrida did, that by getting those voices heard, you will meet new ways of finding solutions to some of these things. So I think in that sense, he's, he's very, very relative. And I also think, you know, as, we, as we've just been discussing, he's relevant, he, um, I said relative, didn't I? He's relevant. Um, he's relevant in, in the sort of way that, you know, that we almost have specters of Derrida, don't we? That, you know, he's become this, again, lightning rod for a particular type of people who are defending their ground. And as long as we can keep recognising the reasons he's become that lightning rod, I think that will help us sort of battle against um, some of the nonsense that's happening in the world at the moment. Thank you very much. And I guess, yeah, with the whole, with, with, especially these days with, uh, with, with alternative truths, post-truths or, uh, you know, deep fake, whatever you want to call it, the, the, the significance of his philosophy and his... Uh, his thinking is is more than relevant. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I do think, you know, if, if you, you obviously have your, your set list for the, the books that you're going to be looking at, but I do think Spectres of Marx continues to kind of come back as this, if we're looking at what is relevant now, it's one of his simpler texts to read, to be honest. There's, there's a lot more sort of very straightforward talking about the political climate of 1989, which is not that different now. Um, but, you know, it's got a bit of Shakespeare in there, um, a bit of Marx, and, you know, it, it is, Derrida, I think it is most sort of conversational, uh, but also just being extremely brilliant. And, um, you know, if you want to understand the world now, then that's a, that's a terrific book to read. Peter, thank you very much for your time. It was an amazing thank conversation. You. Really enjoyed it. Thank you, Montez.